Then there's another question related to this, which is, uh, yeah, here's a, a, a freed family in the fields picking cotton, okay? This is the ideal for white planters. They'll go back to work, they'll pick cotton, just as, it, now, of course, they're free, you've got to pay them something, you can't whip them anymore, but basically they're working pretty much the same as in the old days. But then there were others who said, you know, maybe they're not going to grow cotton. And here a community of interest begins to arise between these southern plantation owners and certain very important parts of, northern, of the northern economic structure. Because cotton, despite, or maybe even because of the disruptions of the war, cotton was still the most valuable product produced by the American economy. It was certainly the most important export crop of the United States. And if what would happen, let us imagine that African Americans did get land and stopped growing cotton. They started growing food for themselves. Not an irrational thing to want to do. Well, what would happen today? I don't know if they could do this in the desert. Let's say the people of Saudi Arabia decided they weren't going to pump oil anymore. They were going to grow food for their families and forget about oil. This would have a very disruptive effect on the world economy. So would the end of cotton production in the United States. Even though other sources had developed in the war in India, Egypt, you still needed a lot of cotton uh, from the United States. Um, and um, uh, history uh, was, uh, let us say, not totally reassuring on this matter. You know, every society that abolished slavery in the Western hem Hemisphere, starting with Haiti in the Great Revolution of the 1790s and then became independent in 1804, and then the British Caribbean, where slavery had been abolished, and then the French Caribbean, where slavery had been abolished, Every one of them had this same fight over control of labor. And in every one of those, even in Haiti, the government tried to force the former slaves back on the plantations and to resume the production of sugar mostly, or coffee in some cases, in those areas. And in every case where they could, the former slaves resisted this, tried to get land of their own. In some places where there was a lot of free land or open land, they could. In some places, they couldn't. And um, the plantation system survives, but only by bringing in new labor. As I said, bringing in workers from China, from India, thousands of miles away to now work to take the place of African Americans on these plantations. In Haiti, it all falls apart, uh, and, and the plantations fall apart Export crops decline enormously, and you get a society of very small plots of land tilled by former slaves and their descendants, growing a little bit of sugar and coffee, but mostly food for themselves. Jamaica, West, in fact, that's why plantation owners in the United States kept saying emancipation in the West Indies is a failure. It was a failure. Why was it a failure? Because sugar production declined after the end of slavery. Now, sugar production elsewhere rose. The sugar production that declined in Jamaica and these places was re you know, recouped by the tremendous expansion of slavery in Cuba in the 19th century, and so that's where the sugar is coming from now, but, where that, but they still have slavery in Cuba until well after uh, the United States uh, abolishes slavery. So, but in a few places, Plantation agriculture survives. For example, Barbados. I don't know if everyone's been down there. Nice, nice place, I'm sure. I've never been there. But um, Barbados, the plantations continue and sugar production continues. Why? Barbados is very small. There is no unoccupied land. All the land was owned by the planters, and therefore the blacks in the former slaves in Barbados had no alternative but to go back or leave. Some of them went to other islands, but if you're staying there, you got no choice but to go to work. Whereas in Jamaica, which is a large island where there was a lot of what they call crown land, land owned by the king, or the queen, I guess, back then, <laughs> Queen Victoria, or um, uh, land that's just uncultivated, many, many former slaves just go and squat, as they say, or take over this land and therefore the plantations begin to fall apart. Same thing happens in British Guiana. 
This is what scholars talk about the difference between open and closed resources. Open and closed resources. If there's available land, people are not going to go to work on a plantation. Now, the South had open resources geographically. The South is a big place. It's not like Barbados. It's a very big place. And a lot of that land is not cultivated at this point. But so the question is, can the open resources be closed politically? Because it's not just a question of geography. It's a question of political power. And as we will see this, but one of the first things that the when Andrew Johnson sets up southern governments under the control of whites, backs have no say whatsoever, one of the first thing these governments do is to pass a set of laws known as the Black Codes. These are enacted in late 1865, early 1866, and in the way I've been discussing it, the Black Codes are an attempt to use political power to close the resources of the South as far as blacks are concerned. Um, they will talk about the politics of this nationally next time, but the key, the black codes recognize certain elements of freedom. They legalize black marriages. They say African Americans can own property with some restrictions. Um, they can go to court and testify against other blacks, not against white people. Um, but the key to these black codes is what they call the vagrancy laws, vagrancy laws. Now, there'd been vagrancy laws in the North. If a guy comes into town and can't make a living, they could sometimes kick him out. But that's, that's not an effort to impose a new labor system. These vagrancy laws basically said any black person, adult, must sign a labor contract at the beginning of the year to work for a white employer for the entire year. If you do not sign such, by the way, this did not apply to poor whites. They could do whatever they want. If you did not sign such a contract, you were a vagrant. If you were working for yourself, you were a vagrant, right? You could have a nice farm supporting your family. You're a vagrant because you're not signing a contract to work for a white employer. If you do sign, if you are a vagrant and, and convicted of that, then you're fined. And if, you're, if you can't pay the fine, you are then auctioned off, just like in slavery to a white bidder who will agree to pay your fine, and then you have to work that off in working for him for the year. Um, let us, uh, here's a cartoon. It's called Selling a Freedman to Pay His Fine. This is from Harper's Weekly. An auction is taking place of a black man standing there with a chain on his hand, just like in slavery, and a man is auctioning him off. Not as under slavery, not for lifetime servitude, but just for the year. He's being auctioned off for the year to pay his fine. Um, there were other provisions of black codes. It made it illegal for one owner, uh, sorry, planter, to hire away the laborer from another place. This is actually, I was just reading the finance, it's great. We're back to this now. Google and, um, and Apple are now being sued because they made such an agreement. They would not hire uh, employees from each other, and that's against the law, folks. I'm sorry, even for multi-billion dollar companies, you cannot just suppress the labor market by saying, I'm not gonna hire anyone from this other company. That's uh, antitrust, et cetera. But anyway, you weren't allowed criminally, it was a criminal offense to hire someone who was under contract to some other planter. Mississippi made it illegal to, for blacks to even own land outside of cities. So they want to make absolutely sure they had no alternative in the countryside than to go to work for white employees. Now, these laws were overturned very fast. The um, Freedmen's Bureau invalidated many of them. And then very quickly, Congress, as we'll see next week, will pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which invalidates all these black codes. The point is not their effectiveness, but this is the white southern planter definition of black freedom embodied in law. Very, very, very narrow. Very narrow. They're not slaves, but they're certainly not what most people would consider free. They are obligated by the law to go to work for a year at a time for white uh, employers. They can't leave. If they leave their job, they forfeit the wages up to that point, et cetera, uh, et cetera.